A number of years ago, Rick Warren, founding pastor at Saddleback Church up in Orange County, um, talked about this idea of the five circles of commitment. And he was talking about it in terms of church, but I think it works throughout um, probably all of our lives. And he says, first of all, when you're thinking about commitment, there is a community, there is a city, there is a location. And then as you kind of move through the community, you move into the crowd. So you go from a very, very large perspective to more of a smaller perspective, there is a crowd. And then in the church world, you move from the crowd to the congregation. So community, crowd, congregation. The fourth circle that he talks about is the circle of commitment, where people actually make commitments. And then he finally says there is a core of people that follow. So I want to start from this sermon from a, from a secular perspective of these five circles of commitment, and I want to talk about our San Diego State Aztecs. <laughs> right? So many of you perhaps were a part of the community two or three weeks ago of San Diego State fans, right? And then we win, and then we win, and now all of a sudden you're like, oh, maybe I'm part of this congregation of San Diego State Aztec. For those of you that don't know, by the way, San Diego State men's basketball play team is playing today in the Elite Eight. Okay, so in case you have not, you're like, I have no idea what Pastor Paul is talking about. You're watching online and you're like, I have no idea. I'm watching across the ocean. I have no idea what you're talking about. So we are in the Elite Eight. So many of you have now moved from perhaps the crowd or the congregation to like, I am core. Like, I am a core SDSU fan. Now, I will know how core of an SD fan you are when next fall comes, okay? Because you may be a part of the core as we move on to the final four and hopefully the final game and we hopefully win, right? Someone thinks I'm jinxing us? No. I believe, right? I believe that we will win, all right? I think that's the way that thing goes. Can I just talk about sports for a while? I'm going to bring up Coach Frieder over here and let him do a little analysis for us of the, of the Aztecs, so... Anyway, but there, this is kind of how we, we live. Like, and, and I think Rick Warren was really onto something as he talks about the church, too. Like, how do we do our mission? Well, we recognize that there is a larger community. And then we try and figure out, well, how do we move that from community into the crowd that's, that's perhaps following at a distance? And how do we then eventually move them into the congregation, whether here um, sitting in the pews or in the chairs, whether watching online, and how do we move to a level of commitment where people aren't just watching or listening in, but they're, they're committed. They're committed with their tithes. They're committed with their offerings. And then how do you move them into the core of like, we want to serve Jesus here at La Jolla Press. And, 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 and if you think about the life of Jesus, these five circles of commitment work as well that he moves people from community to crowd, to congregation, to commitment, to core. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they're kind of the core for Jesus, but he's got his disciples. But as we've seen in this sermon series, as we've been talking about following, there's all sorts of different places where Jesus is preaching and teaching. Sometimes it's to the community. Sometimes it's to the crowd. Sometimes it's just as disciples. Sometimes it's just with Peter, Andrew, James, and John. So last week, if you were here, if you listened in, we zoomed in a lot. We took a kind of a very narrow lens and talked about what does it mean to be a disciple? What is the cost of discipleship? But also, what is the cost of non-discipleship? We want an abundant life. But when we don't devote ourselves to Jesus, it is very hard to find that abundant life. And so there is a cost of non-discipleship. But when we are discipled by Jesus, we find that abundant life that transcends all things. So that was last week. We kind of zoomed way in. And today I want to zoom back out again. And I want for us to consider this theme of who are we following? There's a lot of noise out there. There are a lot of voices out there. There are a lot of ideas out there. 
And so this morning, we want to consider who it is that we are following. And I chose this text because in our text, it, it, it's, it's an interesting text. There's a lot of stuff going on in our text. But there is also a warning that comes from Jesus about following the wrong people or the wrong voice. And it is that warning that I want to lift up this morning as we think about who it is that we are following. Jesus is in the temple courts. Next Sunday, we will look at Palm Sunday as Jesus makes his entrance into Jerusalem. He's standing right near the temple in Jerusalem, this beautiful, ornate structure. And he and the disciples are watching people pass by. And earlier in the text, before we're going to read, Jesus has just made a comment about the religious leaders who love to parade around in their long robes, who love to sit in the seats of authority, who love to hear the praises of the people, and how these rich leaders devour the poor widows. So that's our context. So it's very interesting what follows right after Jesus speaks these words. So we're in the Gospel of Luke, the 21st chapter, and we're going to read the first nine verses. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. Now, some of the disciples, now notice this contrast here. So he says this. Now, some of the disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones, these jewels. They were said to be perhaps as big as 350 square inches. So this is an ornate temple and the gifts with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will the sign be that they are about to take place? He replied, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must first happen but the end will not come right away. And then Jesus goes on to talk about the end of times and the end of the temple in Jerusalem. That is not what we're about this morning. So it's interesting, as you notice the text, I was talking to a member of finance committee, and they said, as we read, started reading Luke 21, they were like, ah, a stewardship sermon, Paul. This is great. And I was like, well... It's hard for me not to talk about stewardship. So I am going to talk about stewardship just briefly because I know the finance committee would want me to do that. And I want to do that, right? I just want to say thank you as Scott does in his, as he leads us into the, the call to, uh, to offering. Uh, we are grateful for your generosity. Uh, through the, we do the fiscal year. So through the end of February, we are running slightly ahead of where we hope to be um, in terms of donations. We did not have a good February. So luckily we were strong all the way through January. We're a little short in February. Expenses continue to be down. Um, But as you all know, it's just expensive to keep a place like this going. The technology that we offer, the streaming that we do, so many different things uh, that are, that cost money that not people don't always think about. So I want to say thank you for that. Thank you for your ongoing generosity that allows us to do our mission. I promised not a stewardship sermon this morning, so I will stop there. I'll save that for a later day. I want you to imagine, though, Jesus and his disciples in front of this massive temple. The original temple, as you may recall, was destroyed in 587 B.C. by the Babylonians. Under King Cyrus in 512 B.C., The Jewish people were allowed to return to Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile, and they built another temple. But it was a wee bit smaller than the original temple. So if you remember in the book of Ezra, as they dedicate this new temple, there is crying of joy and there's crying of great tears because people look at the temple built in 512 BC and say, you know what? It's just not like what it used to be. Have you ever heard that in the church? 
As the church looks back, it's like, do you remember when, right? And this new temple is not quite what the old one was. But around 20 BC, a guy by the name of Herod the Great, who you perhaps recall, decided to start taxing and building a great grand temple in Jerusalem, the stones of which can still be seen near the bottom of the Wailing Wall. And this temple was magnificent and glorious. It was said that from a distance, it looked like it was a mountain with snow-capped peaks. It was true beauty and the investment of so many that had built it. And so Jesus says, look at this widow. This widow who has absolutely nothing. And she goes in and drops her final two coins in the offering plate. And he says, I want you to see the contrast with this great, beautiful, beautifully constructed temple that would continue to be built, right? Until AD 63, when the money runs out. But Jesus, as we've talked about before, said, this temple, this physical temple will not last. And we know that in AD 70, that temple is destroyed. But Jesus is contrasting two things, and he's saying, do you see where people have been investing in the wrong message? All this time, energy, effort to build this great, magnificent temple. And Jesus says, they've missed it. Because I am the true temple. I am the place where God is worshipped. I am the one who will bring peace and hope. And so what Jesus is doing is he is saying, you need to listen for the right voice. I said this a couple weeks ago. I said it better at second service than I said it in first service, so I'm going to go back to it. Like, that's the nice thing of being the regular preacher, right? You're like, oh, I said that better. Like, it was, it was, it was cleaner. It was, like, neater. And so I just want to – so, so I, I made this point. I'm just going gonna, gonna to make the point in a better way than the way I made it the other day. And the, the way I made it the other day was fine. This is just more memorable, okay? My point was this. And you probably don't remember it anyway, so you're going to be like, oh, this sounds great. That sounds wonderful. My point was this. Whatever informs you, forms you. Okay, because I remember I talked about, I I can tell whatever news agency you listen to when I talk to you, I can tell what you're listening to, whether it's CNBC, whether it's MSN, whether it's, you know, CNN, whether it's Fox. I can tell because you're hearing this voice, right? And so I said, whatever informs you is going to form you. Whatever voice is going into your head, through your ears, that voice is going to start forming who you are, how you live, how you behave, and what you say. Now, this can be for good, or this can be for bad. I want to take it from the positive sense. In the book of Acts, these, these apostles, you know, Jesus has gone, and Peter and James and John, they're, they're, they're doing all their ministry, and they're, they're talking about the hope of Jesus, and, and, and they are just solid Like the people do not understand how they can be so confident in the message that they have in Jesus. So much so that when they are dragged in front of the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter four, verse 13, the Sanhedrin is trying to figure them out. And this is what the book of Acts, as Luke writes, it tells us. This is verse 13 of Acts chapter four. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized, and I love this line, they realized something. They were unschooled, ordinary men, They were unschooled, ordinary men, and they're out preaching the gospel of Jesus. When they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they noticed one thing. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. That was the only thing they knew. How could these fishermen who had no education possibly know so much about the scriptures and about God? How could they be so confident? How could they care less what the world did to them? There was only one thing they could think of. They'd been with Jesus. Because whatever informs you is going to form you, is going to change you. 
And this is the message that Jesus is trying to get across in this somewhat subtle of a text of saying, be very careful who you listen to and what they have to tell you. Basically, watch out. The Apostle Paul said the same thing to the leaders of the church at Ephesus in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 31. You may recall this great prayer that Paul eventually prays for the leaders of the church in Ephesus, but also this warning that Paul gives to them in Acts 20. And so I want to turn there. I have a, by the way, I'm just going to give you a little heads up. I have a lot of scriptures I'm unpacking today. So that's why I have a lot of little tags in my Bible in case you wonder, or you may not wonder at all, but I just want to let you know, since we're just having a little chat here this morning. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. As Paul begins to wind up his speech to the Ephesian elders, he says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Be on your guard. People will come in and they will lead you astray. There will be voices that will say they are of God and they are not of God. Be very careful who it is that you follow. So what happened to the church at Ephesus? Hmm, we actually know. You know those letters, First and Second Timothy? Guess where Timothy was pastoring? <laughs> You're like, sounds like Ephesus, just want to make sure. Ephesus, right? He's this young pastor in Ephesus dealing with this group of people who are being obnoxious and difficult. And Paul writes two letters, one with six chapters, one with four chapters, instructing Timothy on how he is to pastor this unruly congregation that has gone their own way and how Timothy is trying to call them back to the truth of Jesus Christ. Because even though Paul had warned them just a few years earlier, guess what happened? They followed the wrong voice. Paul said, watch out. Well, we suspect that perhaps they finally got things on the right path. And then along comes the book of Revelation. Towards the end of that first era of the church, 80, 90 AD, somewhere in there. Do you remember what Jesus tells John to say of the church at Ephesus? That's a little harder question, I know. You have lost your first love. What? I mean, Paul sat there with the elders of the church of Ephesus. They came to him as he was making his journey. He says, watch out for the savage wolves. And you get to Revelation chapter 2. The first church is uh, spoken to is the church of, of Ephesus. And the spirit of Jesus says to John, say to the church at Ephesus, you have forsaken your first love. You're more concerned about the rules and regulations and correct doctrine than you are about loving your neighbor and loving God. Be very careful. Be very careful who it is that you follow. And I think it's a difficult thing in this day and age to sort through how to listen and discern well. So I'm going to attempt in a very short period of time to do um, perhaps maybe a little bit better than a... So I I had this theology professor when I was at Princeton, and we're sitting in class, and this professor asked a question of 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 the class and said, what are the heresies of today? And then wanted us to kind of feed back on, as theologians in training, right, as pastors in training, what were the heresies of the day? Which I thought was actually a really kind of a unique question. I was like, oh, this is something real. Like, this is something I can actually use. Because sometimes in seminary, they give you a bunch of stuff that, guess what? 
it's not all that helpful. I, is that, should I not say that out loud? Um, I'm sure you have things in your own educational past, right, that you would say the same thing of. But I was like, okay, this is good. Let's talk about the heresies of the church. The problem was she didn't really give us any information on, like, how do you determine a heresy, right? Like, we can name them, or at least what we think they are. So very briefly and very quickly, I'm going to talk about some ways that we can begin to sort out, is what I am hearing of God? Is the preacher, or the, and this is always scary, is the preacher or teacher speaking the things of God? Because when I'm doing that, guess what I'm saying? You all can look at me, right? Like this is just the way, because it's just me and me and you, right? All right? So, um, but, I, but I tried to sort out like, what do we, and, and, and I don't, I don't want to say this is a complete list because it's not. But when I hear and see things, like how do I, how do I recognize, how do I determine, how do I discern if this is of God? So I'm just going to roll through four texts. They're going to go fairly quickly. I won't apologize for that. I think you'll get the message of what it is that I'm trying to say in all this. The first thing is this. When I think about, is this person speaking truth? Is this person of the things that God would have this person be about? I think about fruit, okay? And I think about fruit in two different connections and connotations. The first is out of Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 18 or through 20. This is Jesus speaking Sermon on the Mount, okay? He says this, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. In this line, by their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear... Oh, wait, I stopped. I went too far. Sorry. I'll stop right there. The bad trees get burned up, by the way. Okay, that's, that's, that's where I was going right there, in case you want to keep following in that text. Um, what sort of fruit is the person's lifestyle producing? That's what Jesus is getting at there. A good life, a life that follows Christ, you're going to see good fruit. You're going to see something that is produced, a lifestyle, an influence. Galatians chapter 5. I hit this verse a lot. I think it's a very important verse. Perhaps very, very way, way high up there for me, apart from the I am's of Jesus, where the Apostle Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Y'all have this memorized, right? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, patience, Forbearance, they changed that word, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. It's very nice of the AV people to put this on the wall for you, by the way. How do we know it's true? Do we see a lifestyle that reflects the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. A lifestyle doesn't mean that person is always going to display all nine of the fruit all at the same time and get them all right, okay? I'm not trying to justify my behaviors, by the way, in saying that. Um, That is a high calling. But when people talk ugly all the time and people are leading a church and their lifestyle just simply doesn't look like the things of Jesus, we must question and we must wonder, is this of God? The next thing is this. It's ironic that it comes out of 1 Timothy Y'all remember where Timothy was pastoring, correct? Ephesus, in case you've forgotten from seven minutes ago when I just said that. Timothy's pastoring in Ephesus, and the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says this, chapter 6, this is 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verses 3, and the first part of 4. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree in the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. So when and if I put my teaching above the word of God or I contradict Jesus, guess what? I am conceited and I understand nothing. This is Paul's warning. How do you determine truth? Does the preacher, the teacher, the leader speak the whole counsel of God? and speak of Jesus. They'll be known by their fruit. 
They'll be known by how they use the word of God. And the final thing I want to suggest is this, and this is perhaps the hardest. I don't know, it's not hard. It's just a, it's a little frustrating. And this comes out of Acts chapter 5, verses 38 and 39. A guy by the name of Gamaliel is leading the Sanhedrin. This happens very soon after what we read in Acts chapter 4 of the disciples and how they were known because they had been with Jesus. And, and they bring P- James, or Peter and John in front of the Sanhedrin in order for how, them to be judged. And Gamaliel, in all of his wisdom, starts saying, look, all these other people have come and gone who said they, they were the Messiah, who said Jesus is the, who said whatever it is that they had said, they all end up dying. The word never goes forth. It happens for a while, and then it's gone. And then he says this in verses 38 and 39. This is Acts chapter 5. Therefore, in the present case, he says, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. What's he saying? Time will tell. Time will tell, church leaders. Time will tell, pastors. Time will tell, charismatic leaders, if it is of God or it is not of God. Because if it is of God, it will succeed. But if it is not of God, it will fail. And we have seen this. In far too many churches, far too many congregations, far too many wayward leaders who rely on their giftings and do not build a life on God's grace, lead people astray. And so Jesus says, be very careful who or what you follow. So I want to go back to the question I asked at the beginning, who are you following? And I want to read one more text. John chapter 1, verses 35 through 39. I told you I have a lot of scriptures today. I'm trying, having a hard time finding that one. All right, here we go. This will sound familiar, I suspect. The next day, John the Baptist was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, behold, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him, John's disciples heard him say this. They followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. And so they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. The very first words that Jesus speaks in the Gospel of John are those words. What do you want? It's interesting because these two disciples have been a part of John's ministry and now they're a part of the crowd that's following Jesus. And he turns around and he asks them, what is it that you want? Why are you following me? Where is it that you want to go? It's always these simple, loving questions that I believe God asks of us as well. Think about the garden, or think about, yeah, the garden. I almost said the garden of Gethsemane. I'm moving way, 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 way too far into the future there. The garden of Eden. Adam and Eve mess it up. They do, they listen to the wrong voice. That wrong voice leads them down the wrong path. They hide. God comes looking for them. They hear God. And what does God say? Where are you? Not, what the heck did you just do? Which might have been my response, right? Like, I gave you paradise. But where are you? I've come looking for you. And yes, there are consequences. But the promise is God always comes looking for us because even the mission of Jesus was what? To seek and save the lost, to come looking for us. Not to hit us over the head, 
but simply so he can say, what do you want? And the disciples say, we want to know where you are staying. So here's what I want to do as we end the sermon. Because we've been talking about following and we're talking about staying. That word for where are you staying in in John chapter 1 is the word, when you get to John chapter 15, that is the word abide. Where are you abiding? I want to flip that question. And I want to ask you a question. Would Jesus abide? Would Jesus stay where you are staying? Would Jesus abide where you're abiding? As you look at your life, would Jesus be like, this is good. I would love to be with you. Or is there perhaps some places that you really don't think Jesus would want to abide in your life? Places that you've kind of hidden, things that you do or say, where you're not really following Jesus. Because if that's the case, hear this good news as we wrap up this morning. God still loves you. God still pursues you. God says, where are you? I want to be with you. But perhaps as we're following Jesus, there are some places where we need to reorient our lives so that Jesus will delight in abiding with us as we abide in him. Pray with me, please. Jesus, it's a hard question to answer about you abiding with us. The promise is you long to do that. But as we have followed you, and Lord, perhaps as we have moved from congregation to commitment to core, we have also strayed. We have followed the wrong voices. We have been like Adam and Eve, who heard a voice and went down the wrong path. And Lord, we don't need to be filled with regret for that, because that's what your grace is all about. But Lord, may we abide in you so that you might fully abide in us. May we follow you. May our lives reveal the fruit of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. For Lord, we love you. And we're delighted that you love us. And we ask this all in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.